I am uh, humbled to be with the two of you. I'm a great admirer. Laura, thank you for the times that you've come on the show, and the same to Glenn, you guys. Your intensity is just uh, fantastic and an inspiration to all of us. And Amy, what you've managed to build with your fist up uh, attitude and energy and clarity of mind and judgment is an inspiration to us as well. And I'm very honored to be sitting here with you tonight. Um, I've got a few questions, and then, I mean, you know, these are sort of, this is a big award. Izzy is a big figure, and it makes me want to understand your motivations. What may differentiate your motivation from what you see in the rest of the media, as you describe it, Amy? Uh, take us kind of into your professional heart, and how do you see what sets you apart? You, I well understand, and I'm sure many here do, your dissatisfaction with much of what we see in mainstream media. What in your core motivation sets you apart? First of all, I work with a wonderful group of journalists who are dedicated and passionate about journalism, not as a trade, but as a mission. Um, I think our job is to go to where the silence is. I was deeply affected in 1991, as Myra was describing my experience in Timor, one of the things that very much shaped me early on in my career. Um, uh, going to East Timor, the small island nation 300 miles above Australia in 1990 and 1991. And in 91, there with a, my colleague, also an extremely um, brave journalist like Laura, like Glenn, uh, Alan Nairn. And we went to cover the Indonesian occupation of Timor, one of the worst genocides of the late 20th century. And um, the second time we went, you know, we went to the main church in Dili, the capital, and the women were crying in mass. We didn't know if it was the standard sorrow of Timor or if something had happened. We learned afterwards the Indonesian military had shot into the church where many had taken refuge so they could speak to a UN delegation that was supposed to come to investigate the occupation. And they killed a young man inside. The next day they had a mass funeral for him and two weeks later they had a commemoration procession. And we followed this procession through the streets of Dili, through this geography of pain. And we we're asking people as the Indonesian military lined the route, you know, armed by the most powerful country on earth. The Indonesian military was armed by the United States. Why are you risking your lives to do this? And that responsibility to hold the mic and have people who have not been heard in the rest of the world say, for my mother, for my father, for my village, it was wiped out. We got to the cemetery, and that's when we saw the Indonesian soldiers marching up. The people could not escape. There were walls on either side of the road. There were thousands of people there. This was November 12, 91. And the Indonesian soldiers marched up. Alan and I walked to the front of the crowd thinking, well, maybe, just maybe, our presence as Western journalists would stop this attack. I put the microphone above my head. Alan put a camera above his head. I put my headphones on. I took my tape recorder out and put it on my shoulder because we'd always hidden our equipment before. Because if the Indonesians caught Timorese speaking to us, the Indonesian military, we were afraid they would capture them, they would kill them. So we made very clear who we were now. And the soldiers marched up and they swept around the corner without warning, without provocation. They opened fire on the crowd, gunning people down around us. Um, a group of them came at me. They grabbed my mic. They threw me to the ground. Alan got a photograph of them open firing on the crowd. He threw himself on top of me to protect me. And then they took their USM-16s like baseball bats, slammed them against his skull until they fractured his skull. We lay on the road. They were killing everyone around us. They lined up in firing squad fashion, put the guns to our heads. We knew they had killed other journalists in Timor. And they were shouting at us. Um, uh, Australia, were we from Australia? And they were shouting um, politique, saying we were political to be here. But that is our job, to go to where the silence is, to show what was happening on the ground. And when they said Australia, we were very concerned because 
1975, when Indonesia invaded East Timor, there were five Australian-based journalists covering the invasion. And they lined them up against a house, and they executed them. The sixth, named Roger East, was the last reporter reporting for the world in a radio station in Dili, um, Australian. And they broke into the radio station, dragged him to the harbor. And as they were doing with so many Timorese, they shot him into it as he shouted, I'm Australian. Um, the, the Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We because, believe because years later, Australia and Indonesia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, which divided up Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. And so as we lay there, Alan covered in blood on the ground, their guns at our heads, we shouted back, no, America, America, we're from America. They'd stripped us now of everything, but they decided not to kill us. We believe because we were from the same country their weapons were from. And they moved on. Um, a Red Cross jeep pulled up, dragged an old Timorese man, and they'd beat into a sewer ditch. We were able to get into it. And um, we drove, they drove us to a hospital where they were treating the Timorese. And all I'll just end by saying is when the doctors and nurses saw us, they started to cry, I think because of what we represent, not just to the people of Timor, but all of us, not even as journalists, but especially from the most powerful country as Americans, to the rest of the world. Two things, the sword and the shield. And that shield, well, the sword, because the US government provides weapons in so many places or uses them themselves. And the shield, the American people. They see a difference between governments and the people. And as journalists, you know, we are there on the ground with people in our country and around the world. And they saw that shield bloodied. And I think we have a decision to make every day, not only as journalists. I don't separate myself very much from other people. Whether we're professors, um, librarians, whether we're you know, doctors, nurses, um, lawyers, whether we're artists, whether we're employed or unemployed, we have a decision to make every day whether we want to represent the sword or the shield. A shield, if we pick it up. Laura, what drives you? I think first and foremost, it's really a desire to express something about the world that we find ourselves in on human terms. I mean, I think that's, that's sort of the motivation for, for all of the work. So um, I feel that we find ourselves in really difficult times and that I have some skills that I can use to try to understand the world better, and, and I have questions and things that I'm passionate about, but it's trying to say something that I think are, that, that are wrong. I mean, I think that we've entered into a moral vacuum in the post-9-11 era, that we're doing things that, we, that were unimaginable you know, before, before um, September 2001. <coughs> I think it's unimaginable that we would have a prison that would be open for, for over you know, 13 years where people would be held and never charged. I mean, how is this the United States? How is this a democracy? And so I think to sort of talk about or respond to that moral vacuum and to say something. And, and so I think I'm motivated as a filmmaker in that desire to, to express um, something about the reality um, that we're living in. Um, and then, of course, it's also journalism. You know, it's those things that beca it's, 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 you know, journalism and, and trying to capture the world in a way that that uses stories and enters into people's lives so that you can understand things more deeply on a, on, a, on a human level with some sort of belief that if you can understand from, you know, from the, the smallest, you can understand the, the bigger issues that, that are at play. You now, because of your work, have a stature, a profile, a degree of recognition that is rare for independent journalists. Has it lessened your sense of vulnerability when you go about your work? Yeah, sure. I mean, obviously, um, I mean, it could have gone any way. It could have gone different ways. I mean, how this, how this played out. I mean, you know, we had, there were a lot of meetings with lawyers about possible, you know, subpoenas or indictments. I mean, th those were things that could have happened, but they didn't, luckily. And so, yeah, be, being more high profile, I think, protects the work uh, for sure. And I think um, makes it harder to be to be targeted in the same way that had happened when I was being r routinely I just wanted to say when Laura and Glenn first came back to the United States almost a year after reporting um, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong with Edward Snowden, remember those reports, they did not then come back into the country, um, into the United States. And the day they came back was um, 
the day of the George Polk Awards. They were both getting the award. It would be very hard for the government as they flew in from Germany at Kennedy Airport to pick them up. How ironic as they were trying to get one of the you know, most prestigious awards in American journalism. And so we all at the hotel where they were going to get this award were there. Are they going to be picked up? But I don't think the fact that they weren't and they weren't hit with a subpoena at that point means, oh, come on, they never were going to this whole thing is a lot of hype. It's actually precisely because they have worked so hard and so many, and the attention has been paid to them. I'm sure at every point there was, they were making, the government was making a decision about what to do. And it is, that's the power of journalism, is to shed a spotlight, shine a spotlight. It, and if we shine it on the most important issues, um, you know, when I was growing up, I watched soap operas every single day. And you, they were riveting. They're the daily stories. They weren't people like me, but it was the only thing where they weren't just killing each other. So you'd watch it. And I see if you use that model to cover really important issues, to see what happens to people every day as they're trying to get through their lives, the large forces that affect them, how they affect the world, um, you can, you know, people will be riveted. But what Laura and Glenn did, risking everything, maybe not being able to come back to the United States, but have really opened up the space, I think shamed the US government. Not only the content of what they exposed showed what the US government, then the US government had to say, that is not what we're doing. Um, and they couldn't, um, you know, they couldn't kill the messenger at that point. And that opened up space for many others. Our time is precious and short. We have until 6.30. If you have questions, come to the mic and I'll take them. Let me ask you this. Um, Amy, you describe your dissatisfaction with the mainstream media when we understand we can see all the ways in which it's tied into the status quo. Where does your hope lie? You've got, I mean, Laura, I'll ask you as well, but you're, you're working on The Intercept with Pierre Omidyar. Uh, Jeremy Scahill, a, a producer with Democracy Now! is one of the founders of that kind of digital effort. What, I'll ask you each, but where does your hope lie for the future of the kind of journalism that you've come to exemplify that we honor when we honor you and I have Stone? Amy, I'll go first to you. Um, well, first of all, the grassroots movements that don't give up. I mean, you do not achieve democracy. You know, we're called democracy now. You don't achieve democracy. You fight for it every single day. And people in the face of the greatest adversity, you know, in Ferguson being there, um, people who had the least power, it just didn't matter. They were standing up. Even the Occupy movement, which some in the mainstream media, my God, excoriated, more importantly, ignored um, for a long time, um, uh, laughed at them, uh, said, you know, what do these people represent? Even though the police eviscerated these encampments all over the country, and you can say, so what did they accomplish? They changed the entire language and conversation. I don't think anyone in America doesn't understand the term 99%, 99%. and 1%. Yeah. Um, Occupy became the most used word. It made an enormous difference. And these grassroots actions, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, the whole questioning of how it is in our society that still and increasingly, you know, you have that vast sucking sound of uh, from the bottom to the top in terms of the economy, people are pushing back. And that is what journalists should be covering. Laura, where does your hope lie? Is it you and Glenn on the on the no, uh, I mean, for balcony me it's, in it's, Rio? <laughs> no, it's, I mean, for me, it's, it's the power of individuals to change the circumstances. And I don't have a lot of hope right now in our political system. I think that it's, it's really, we're in dire shape in terms of our democracy and our representative officials. But I think when you see engaged young people, politically engaged young people, I think that that's, that's where, you know, where there's hope. Hi, thank you both for being here. You are patriots. Thank you for your service. Um, Amy, you bring sanity to an insane world. Laura, the exposure, and Glenn Greenwald, who you have given voice to also, truly amazing to be able to meet you. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. I'm um, kind of an overall question about surveillance and the government's reaction. I mean, uh, Obama came out, I think, after you exposed all this to Edward Snowden and said, well, we're going to have the debate, and I welcome the debate. And now I don't hear much more than occasional smatterings of legislation. Where do you see this, I guess, do you think the government's reaction has been what you expected or maybe you didn't expect anything? And both of you, looking out 10 years from now, are we just gonna be more hoodwinked? Is the government gonna to try to be more savvy and expand the surveillance state? Do you wanna see anything 
bringing it back in? And what do you give as advice to individuals of how we conduct ourselves so we're not uh, smothered well, by there, I mean, there are two questions. One is what we can do as individuals is separate from what the, the response has been. I mean, I think it's um, very, very disappointing, the lack of response. I mean, I personally think that the, the, two, the Section 215 collection program that I showed the clip on, which is still in effect today, I think it violates the Fourth Amendment. And, and but right now, we, there are um, legal challenges now that we have documents. So there, there, there are legal challenges, and we'll hopefully have some more um, oversight in terms of what the government's doing, so it's not just happening in secret. But actually, there's a lot that individuals can do without having to wait for the government, particularly around issues of surveillance, <coughs> which is not handing all of your information over, for instance, to private companies, and also to use encryption. And, you know, I mean, I think that that's been one of the, you know, that we're seeing companies now knowing that, that individuals want privacy in their communication and that it's essential <coughs> for a profession. I mean, if you're a journalist, it's, it's, I think it's negligent if you're not using encryption with, in, with sensitive sources. And, and so that, but that is easy. You can do that tomorrow. You can download, you know, the Tor browser and, and browse the internet anonymously and not leave a trail between your unique IP address and everything you're interested in. Hmm. You want to pick up, up, Amy, as well, the future of surveillance and public policy? I think it's all going to be dependent on how willing the media is to stop that unholy alliance with the government, that revolving door, and really question what's going on. You know, the New York Times recently apologized um, for their coverage after 9-11. It is really important that at the moment things happen, that's when um, the voices of dissent are so important. And so rarely you get that in the media. I also want to mention Julian Assange, who's holed up in the, you know, in the um, Ecuador. Ecuadorian embassy in London right now. I, I visited him last on Independence Day, uh, had an extended interview with him. He's been there for almost three years now. Um, and you think about what he did and really laid the groundwork for Snowden and for what Lauren Glenn have done and um, really, well, has clearly risked his freedom. But, you know, you go back to, to what he released, um, what WikiLeaks did, the Iraq logs, the Afghanistan logs, the State Department cables going back 40 years, and how he was trashed not just by politicians in this country, but by journalists. And yet, what is our job? For, I want to use one example. In February of 2007, one of these logs that came out in Iraq, uh, there was a story of um, two guys uh, who, uh, it was an Apache helicopter above. It was hovering. And there were two Iraqis. And the Apache helicopter called back to their forward operating base. And they said, what do we do? There are these two Iraqis who have their hands up, and they seem to be surrendering. Um, the lawyer at the base said, you can't surrender to a helicopter. And so they blew them away. That's um, in the beginning of 2000, and uh, uh, that, was the that, was, that was the beginning of that year. Um, six months later, that same, I think that people would have gasped like you did, and they would have investigated if they'd known at the time. We only learned well after. Go forward six months. Uh, to July of 2007, I think it was July 12th, when a group of Iraqis, after their community was bombed in New Baghdad, a part of Baghdad, were bringing two journalists around. Well, one, Mir Nureldin for Reuters, and uh, the man who drove him around uh, named Saeed Shema. He was 40 years old, and Mir is an up-and-coming journalist with Reuters, had video cameras. He was like 22 years old, and they were showing them the area that same Apache helicopter unit above. And they call back to base. They're not rogue. And they say, what should we do? We see these guys below. Can we engage them? Can we open fire? They get permission, and they blow them away. These are two Reuters employees. Um, Zaid Shema managed to drag himself away. He is hit. A uh, jeep pulls up from the area, a van there uh, of dad with his two children. He wants to help the wounded. Um, and they ask permission to engage again, and they blow up the jeep and kill Saeed. And all the 12 men were killed. Reuters tried for years to get this videotape. They couldn't get it. Why? National security? Why? Want to know what happened to their, the people that worked for Reuters. Um, and it was ultimately um, uh, 
um, Julian Assange, who released this. And I think if we had the original documents at the time of the original killing of the Iraqis, it never would have happened six months later. That's why this information is so important. And we also have to think about Chelsea Manning in jail for decades now because he saw the videotape of this July 12th, I think it was 2007 moment. Um, and he said, Reuters has been asking for this. They have all been asking for this. Why has this, why is this not available? We have to have, and that's what journalists are about, providing, getting the information for there to be a national discussion so we can decide how we want to be as a nation. Sir. Um, as a former Neiman Fellow, I would like to uh, congratulate you and show my appreciation for your bravery, your physical bravery, in going after these stories. It's, I think, quite incredible. Um, I also would like to ask Laura Poitras about Snowden. You've had contact with him, and we don't hear very much about him these days. I'm wondering, is he going to stay in Russia forever? Is he trying to make a deal with the American justice system to come back and get a lighter sentence? Because I'm sure he will be accused and convicted of espionage. What do you see as his future? Well, um, I'm not on his legal team, so I don't know the, the, the details about that. But I know that he has he put in asylum applications with a couple dozen countries. Um, and I, I mean, I think it's unfortunate. He doesn't want to be where he is now. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised in the coming years if another country came forward. And in terms of him coming back to the U.S., I, that I can't speak to. I mean, are you in contact with him, Laura? I am in contact with him. Yeah. How, how does he feel about everything that's transpired? I mean, I think he felt. I mean, his his you know, real fear was nobody would actually skip a beat. And obviously that you know that we happened. Skipped a beat. We skipped a beat. <laughs> yeah. So um, so I think that his his goal to make sure that that the public knew what the government was doing because that's his that's his sort of baseline. He feels that in a democratic system that these kinds of policies that have such vast implications for all of us should not happen in secret. And he also feels that they were violations of, of our constitution. And and so that now we're informed of that. So I th and and we care. So I think that those were that was his, you know, concern that, that that wouldn't happen. And the fact that that those things, you know, clearly um, he's he succeeded in that. No Sorry. regrets. No regrets. No. No. Uh, he's been joined by his wife, hasn't he? A uh, partner, and Lindsay Mills. Yeah. By his partner. And is he comfortable in Russia? Or do you I, think he'd like to go somewhere else? I, I, you know, honestly, I'm not, he doesn't tell me about his daily life. And, and I, that's, you know, he's kind of very compartmentalized in that sense. So. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I'm Laurie. I'm, I'm a current Neiman Fellow. And then it's, it's such a massive honor to be in the same room as both of you. You're, you're both my heroes. I, uh, and you're so brave. And, and I don't honestly care if you're patriots or not, to be honest. I'm not, not <laughs> from America. I don't think it really matters. I think it's more Where important are you from? that you're I'm from the UK. Um, I think it's your heroes, and, and that's the, the important thing. But uh, my, my question is about uh, what you often hear in journalism at the moment is this question about politics and where politics should come in. There's still this hangover of an idea that the perfect journalist is just, you know, a fly on the wall, very, very, you know, quote unquote objective, just, you know, not bringing politics in in any way. And um, that that is somehow achievable. And there is a perfect blank slate vision of journalism that can and should be achieved. Um, and I was wondering, um, how you feel about where the politics can and should come in in journalism, what aspect of pioneering investigative and independent journalism is inherently political and, and should it be? I mean, uh, I, I, would, I mean, I have several things I would say to that. I, I think, I mean, as citizens, we're also citizens. You know, we don't stop being citizens if we're journalists. And I think as citizens, there are certain things that we are obligated to speak out against if you know, for instance, Guantanamo being uh, an obvious example. Um, I, I, but in terms of my work, I'm not interested in making work that projects my political worldview. I'm actually interested in learning and asking questions and being challenged and making work that's open enough that people can come away with different conclusions. People can decide, do they like this person or not, hopefully, in, in the work that I do. So I, although I, I'm not shy that I'm critical of US policy and 
but I'm not trying to sort of map my worldview into my films. I'm actually trying to make things that are more open and that are, that are about people and that it's about the, the people who are in the film, that it's their kind of world that we're entering into. Amy, I'm very interested in your response to this question. Um, you know, I think everyone has a point of view. And I know more about the mainstream corporate journalists on television, their views on every issue. When it is part of the consensus, it is seen as their objective. When you're outside of that consensus, which, by the way, I think more often than not represents most people, you know, I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, um, concerned about the environment, concerned about the growing disparity um, in this country, um, those who are concerned about racial injustice, um, are not a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. We have to be fair. We have to be accurate. We have to, I feel on Democracy Now!, if people feel that they represented themselves accurately, that's what's important, that they're not misrepresented, um, and that they have a say. And most people, most views are not heard. I really do think in this country, Conservative and liberal lines are breaking down. Even though you hear about the, uh, you know, log jam, the quagmire in Washington, uh, you know, the divided de Democrats and Republicans, that's not how most people live their lives. And we have to get outside of that and really show what's happening on the ground. Thank you. This is a special evening. This is a special honor. I have Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence. I want to give you the floor for one last, you know, have another whack, each of you. Whatever you want to say at this exalted moment, say it now. We want to hear it. Laura? Well, I mean, I just think, how many of people in the room are, are journalists? I mean, I think it's actually a really exciting time to be doing this work. I mean, I think people are, there are new outlets and there are ways you can reach people with not having to go through the, the, the corporate media. And that's, it's really exciting. And, and it's wonderful to be doing work at this time. Mm -hmm. um, go to where the silence is. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't follow the pack, for sure. Laura Poitras and Amy Goodman, we are honored. You are heroes. Thank you very, very much for being here.